This is exciting because we actually have Andy Irwin. Now, he has produced films like I Can Only Imagine, American Underdog, just to name two of the movies I'm in. Uh, <laughs> but, but he has a new movie out called The Jesus Revolution. Welcome to the show. Uh, this is where I start the apology tour, Wally, that we didn't get you in this one. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little yeah. shocked. Why? You're kind of our secret sauce, like yeah. like, like our secret oh weapon. Gosh. Thank so you. So this idea, <laughs> this idea to cause a fight between the two, yeah. this idea that we should have had this Philip Seymour Hoffman shock job in the 70s yeah. and you would have been perfect but you know you, you're too expensive now that you're a star yeah that's true I mean I'm making residuals uh, <laughs> so what are you going to do now uh, you know yeah and I want to get to that too about being typecasted because okay. I need to be in Branch some out. movies that aren't just DJ roles we'll get to that uh, in a little bit no, but it's not. no 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 we will uh, so the Jesus Revolution is about the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s and it's also the faith story of Pastor Greg Laurie okay right. so I remember like right after Underdog and mm-hmm. and I was talking to you and you're like, we got this new thing that I'm really yep. geeked about. And you were telling me it was about the story of Greg Laurie and the pastor. And I'm, I remember thinking, really? <laughs> like, 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 okay, you're like super excited about this. Okay, good, good, interesting choice coming off of an NFL story with, you know, yep. uh, Kirk Warner. And now we're going to go with the pastor. Okay, why tell this story? What about this story that had you so excited about it? Yeah, it's it's funny because where there's inspiration, we had the same reaction when we were talking about about doing I Can Only Imagine. Like, uh, you know, I heard one comedian was like, what was the pitch session like that? It was like, oh, we've got this big robot movie or this one about this giant ship that sinks as a love story. Or we got this guy that pitches a song because his dad died and the record label says yes. Yeah. Like, do that movie. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you never know what inspiration is going to hit you. But with this one, uh, this film was one that my brother was passionate about for a while. And so we did a movie called Woodlawn about eight years ago. And in that movie, it dealt with the end of the Jesus movement and, and this you know kind of school that found you know their way uh, into this spiritual revival. But there was a, a magazine cover that John found that it was Time Magazine. And on the cover, it was 1969, I believe. And the cover said it was a black cover and on it it just had the white letters that said is god dead and then four years later he found a time magazine cover that said the jesus revolution and he was like what the heck happened between those two covers yeah like it had to be a seismic event Hmm. and so as he began to dig into that story and and learned you know greg lori was a hippie kid in the middle of it there was this pastor chuck smith that was the first to kind of let the hippies in the church that Kelsey Grammer plays in our film. He is fantastic, he's by so the way. Good. Okay. He's so good. That brings up this. Like, how did he's a good get? How yeah. did you get Kelsey Grammer to do this? That's like a really big burn on him. No, no, no. I don't mean it that way. No, I mean, yeah. How did, did you yeah. take it that way? Because I, 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 I've I've learned with Wally that you know just to let it bounce off. <laughs> no, no. Like, okay, okay, okay. I'm a little insulted, but no, no again. No, yeah. no. It's I'm a good pretty get. too. He's an actually a good actor. So. How did you, you actually get got it? somebody good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. That, that's, well, hold on. I got a Kevin yeah, Sorbo yeah, question yeah. coming up. Oh, no. <laughs> Beat yourself. Uh, uh, I'm uncomfortable in my work environment. And so, uh, uh, so no. With 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 Kelsey, he was on his back porch and was like uh, out, just kind of having this one of his kind of you know evenings on the back porch. And he said he he's not a, a big praying kind of guy, but he just said he said a prayer that that night of like I want to do something with my life that counts. Huh. Went into his office and his agent had put the script for Jesus Revolution on it. And he read it. And he's like, you're going to think I'm crazy. I'm doing this movie. Really? And he did it. And after he saw the final product, he told he told me and John, he's like, he's like, this is my favorite thing I've ever been a part of. Really? So it was just one of those things that was supposed to happen. And then to put him in scenes with Jonathan Rumi plays this uh, hippie evangelist, uh, Lonnie Frisbee in this story. So Jonathan, of course, is Jesus from The Chosen. And the scenes between uh, between that car- character Lonnie that Jonathan plays and Chuck Smith that Kelsey plays, they're magnetic. It's oh, absolutely. amazing together. So it was a great cast. They both do such a good job at what they're doing. And that's the, the interesting thing about you and what you do with your stuff is you don't just hire the Kevin Sorbos, you know, like and make it a Christian <laughs> movie. Sorry, I'm sorry, but like, but you don't. Like you you hire people that are going to be good actors yeah. or good for the movie, whether they're believers or not. Right. And I've always respected that. Sure. And people gravitate towards that because you, right. it's almost, is it almost like, do you almost envision it like an outreach for you as yeah. part of what you're doing while making the movie? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big part of what we do. Like, you know, each person's kind of called to make their kind of films and certain people you know, want to make their films and they like to have an all Christian cast and all Christian crew. And that's great. We actually are a little bit more rough and outside the box that we feel very outwardly focused towards people outside the church walls. That's our mission field. Yeah. So we're not afraid to hire people that believe completely the opposite that we believe. 
as long as they take the material seriously and they do their homework. So, like in a situation like, you know, um, in American Underdog, when we cast Anna Paquin to play Brenda, because she's not a believer. You no, know, she's not. And she that was the first thing she said when we had a phone call. She's like, "I'm not a person of faith at all." Uh, it's just not something that's you know, it's just really foreign to me. But I'm fascinated with this story. Is that a problem with me playing a Christian? And I was like, "No, Anna. Not as long as you take this seriously and do your homework." So she comes on set the first week and is like, hey, I've, I've read every one of Brenda's books. I've watched every one of her Women of Faith speeches. Nice. And I understand it's more of a you know relationship than a religion. And this person's born again. How does somebody get born again? What is that like? Oh, wow. And so we had these like really deep spiritual conversations. That was her job for doing the movie. So why wouldn't I want to cast an Oscar winner in the role if it gives me a chance to talk to him about Jesus? So yeah. it's great. And then you guys, too, I mean, as you guys live out your faith in the midst of that, there's got to be something different, too, on the set when they see you guys praying here and there. They see how you guys resolve conflict or what have you that I think is indelible, you know, for them as well. You told like I didn't know this. There's a great story again talking uh, with Andy Irwin about the Jesus Revolution, but there's a great subtext story of this. There's a character in the movie who is uh, like a a guy in a wheelchair, drug addict, feels like he's beyond the scope of God's love. And okay, that's great. That's a good storyline inside of this. It fits with what's going on in the movie. But the the story behind the story is pretty stinking amazing. Yeah, it was cool. It was So this character uh, is a Vietnam vet uh, that comes home from the war and is kind of homeless and a drug addict. And uh, in the midst of us, you know, when when John and the team were cast in the film, uh, there was this social media story about this kid uh, named Sean Weiss. And if you remember back when you know we were younger, there was the Mighty Ducks movies, mm-hmm. right? So the 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 goalie played uh, in that movie was this kid Gold- Goldberg. He was the heavy set Goldberg. Kind of, Goldberg, yeah. yeah. Everybody loved Goldberg. <laughs> well, the kid that played him, Sean Weiss, after being a kid actor, bottomed out, got into drugs. Uh, and got into meth and ended up being homeless on the streets of L.A. And he had just, after being on meth and almost dying, he had just tried to get into recovery and had gotten sober, and his story hit social media. Well, our boss at Lionsgate, who's not a Christian, saw the story and was like, isn't this kind of one of the people that you're telling about in the story? He's like, you ought to put him in the movie. Mm. And we was like, that's a great idea. So we contacted him. We flew him in. Lionsgate paid for all the expenses to make sure that he was on set. And when we got to that baptism scene on the beach of Pirate's Cove, Greg Laurie was there on set. And before we started doing the scene, Sean comes up to Greg and is like, can you walk me through how to pray this prayer for real? Real, Because I want to make this decision Crazy. and I want you to baptize me for real. Crazy. Wow. And so we like, everybody cheered and then he got baptized for real after making a decision for Christ. And it was just like this organic thing that happened that no nobody planned on, but it just was kind of imitated what the movie was about. And it's a it's a pretty cool movie that's both rebellious and super super overt in its content. See, and I love that. Like that's the thing too. Again, it's that the thing that you guys do off the set that it makes your movies, I think, even more successful on screen. You mm-hmm. know, because of the heart behind that. Like that's awesome. Like you talk about uh, the guy who plays Jesus from the Chosen. Was he happy just to not be playing Jesus? <laughs> like, like that has to be a great day well, for kinda, him. It's kind of <laughs> you know it, you know what Jonathan's done. It, it lines up with those iconic characters. <laughs> In film, it's like how do you move on from being Luke Skywalker? Right. It's like you know, you know, or or Frodo Baggins or right. one of those kind of characters. It's like you're always going to be a poor because it's so indelible. But Jonathan's a fantastic actor, and you know what he's done on the Chosen is definitely special. But this character is uh, is one that is a different side of him. There's a there's a dangerousness to his character in this one, and then also. Uh, there's a humor. Like he gets some of the best yep. one liners in the film that just like bring down the house. And a lot of that was just Jonathan on the spot, you know, being funny. Oh, really? Yeah, some oh. of that stuff was just, he just kind of threw in these one liners at the end of scenes and it's just like, oh my gosh, that's yeah. hysterical. <laughs> so he'll he'll definitely charm you in a way that's, you know, it's, it's uniquely Jonathan. It's, you know, the actor that you love, but it's a different shade. Of okay. anything that he's done. So it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Well, here's the thing, too. I was curious because, you know, you tell a story from this perspective. So it's the Jesus movement in the late 60s, early 70s. And just a, a quick little synopsis of it. Basically, uh, the guy who goes on to be Pastor Greg Laurie, uh, you know, is being affected by this. He's doing drugs and stuff. And then he gets into this church, has, a, you know, an encounter with Jesus and then gets to, you know, live out his faith and and 
run a church. Do you know if he ever went to seminary? Like, I don't know that about Greg. I mean, he's such a wild, a wild guy. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like Greg could literally tell me anything about himself, and I believe it. <laughs> he's, kind of, he's lived so many different lives, and you're just like he's part evangelist, he's part hippie, he's part you know music lover, part you know kind of uh, actor. He's a little bit of everything. So. You know, he's had a, an interesting. I don't know because he's that with Harvest of, Church. Yeah, like, that's Harvest a Church, that's a huge, huge church. church. And I mean, he's, he's like the last of the Jedi. Like he's the yeah. the guy that one of the last guys that can fill stadiums in the U.S. for these big, you know, evangelistic rallies that he does that are kind of in the the vein of a Billy Graham. And so, uh, yeah, he's he's a special dude. I think the thing that I like the most about the movie is. You know, people come into it thinking it's going to be one thing. And I'm sure you got to go to the screening the other night with all of our friends. Uh, And and I'm sure when you first get invited to something like that, you're thinking like, oh, it's going to be another kind of Jesus movie. But when you watch it, it's so um, it's got such a rebellious kind of take. You know that it's uh, it's it's pretty wild to watch people's reactions because these weren't like the bad kids going to do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. The idea was they were, these were kids that were looking for the right things, whether it's truth or love or to belong. They were just looking for it in all the wrong places. And we were told like LSD was going to be what unlocked their minds. And then the bottom dropped out. And then in the midst of this, this spiritual awakening that we haven't seen since just hit these kids and they went from being freaks to Jesus freaks. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's something really interesting. And then the other thing that trips us out is we started showing it to a lot of secular audiences and our, our bosses at Lionsgate and everybody. And the thing that that makes them just kind of flip out is they're like, this is in our language. This is counterculture. But it's about Christianity. Right. And how does these two things go together? Mm. And they do, you can see they're just their they're wheels spinning trying to figure out why do I love this movie? It's very kind of, well, very I have to tell you the thing I really loved. So uh, like before going to the premiere. All right. So I go to another movie. I don't even remember what I was seeing. But like my best friend is agnostic. Right. And so and we're open about it. We sure. make jokes about it sure. and stuff because we know where each other stands and stuff. So we're walking into the theater to go see this other movie. And there's this big Jesus Revolution poster, the <laughs> yep. banner thing. Yep there yep. and he looks at it and he goes oh that's one i won't be seeing uh, and so awesome. we uh we go into the theater and sure enough here comes the trailer for jesus revolution and so we're watching it and and i'm watching him kind of watch it and stuff and then i'm talking with his wife and everything after and 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 he's like you know what that actually looks pretty good yep. and i'm like oh that's uh, to me i'm like thank you for yep. making that kind of a film yep. because this is somebody that you know i i want to see come to faith and and like i we've had all these conversations but but he like looked at this and went, man, that looks yep. good. And I and just from the trailer alone, and I think the theme that made him understand that or what resonated is this theme of like inclusion mm-hmm. and how this pastor took the outcast and brought him in. And that's yep. what we're supposed to do with yep. the, with our faith. So I mean, do you think that that's one of the messages that you think will re- like resound yeah, you know, with people? Absolutely, it was pretty pretty wild because you know I think that. You know, inclusion has become such a dirty word with right. Christianity because it's it's meant to kind of portray this idea of you know uh, and uh, you know uh, thoughts that we f- feel like are pushing us to not be who we are. But I think when you look at that word in the context of what we do, it's evangelism. Right. Evangelism is an invitation. Come as you are. To be included. To, and to be yeah. included. Yeah. And so the idea of using the, people's own expectations and. And uh, ideas, uh, you know, in a way that they they don't see it coming. It Trojan horses the gospel. So when we showed it to Lionsgate, the first thing they said, we thought they're going to get a lot of pushback that it literally has Jesus in the title. Yeah, <laughs> it's very overt as far as the content. But they watched it and they came up and had tears in their eyes, like this is so inclusive. It's an invitation to, to the to the rejects that the church didn't want. I'm like, absolutely. They're like, we love this film. It's the kind of movies we want to make. Nice. So for them, it would like, it let their guard go down. But for us, what we're trying to do is plant the seed of the idea of the gospel. And, you know, you know, we'll, we'll play the game to, to be able to get that message out there. Well, it's interesting that this was set in the sixties and seventies, but the same thing is still today. Yep. I mean, it, it hasn't relevant. changed. We, we, as people haven't changed, you're still looking to belong and you're still looking for someone to yep. give a rip about you. Yep. And that's where the church hasn't always been known for doing that. And so like this kind of thing I think is, is healthy for people because they are looking for yep. meaning and they are looking to, uh, you know, belong. And I do like the fact that you guys didn't just show the road 
cozy side of yeah. church. Like you showed the one pastor not wanting people or other people in the yep. church not wanting these people. And then people getting it out of whack in thinking they were bigger than God, you know, like, and I think that's important. Do you ever worry though, like as you tell these stories that people might then go, yep, I knew it. Christians are all like that and miss the the overriding message. I think that that fear a lot of times keeps us uh, from actually making really good stories. I yeah. think that people say they don't like cheesy, cheesy Christian films. Mm -hmm. I think what they're reacting to, it's not the message. It's the delivery system. And I think Absolutely. The, the delivery system, I think, is Christians are afraid mm -hmm. to not present a Pollyanna version of their faith. Yep. And so we edit out all the flaws. We edit out all the conflict. In the absence of conflict, there's no tension. Tension's what drives a story forward. And that makes a cheesy film. Whether that's a Hallmark movie or a Christian movie, <laughs> it doesn't matter. If it's just too easy, then as human beings, we were like, okay, that's not a story. So we lean into the idea of... What is the conflict? What drives the tension? And where are the flaws? Where's the humanity? Because that's real life. And I think you look at the Bible, the Bible's full of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think God put it in there to show that it's not about the people being perfect. It's about that what they believed and what they were affected by. That's the thing was was the thing that was of real value. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we just we're, we don't shy away from the conflict that Christians are messy. Well, I think the thing is, anytime agenda pops up in art is where it gets murky and where people get off the bus yeah. right away. And and Christian films suffer from this. Like you start telling this story yep. and then there's that pivotal moment right. and bam, the agenda hits you in the <laughs> face. And you're like, oh, OK, now I know what we're in, yep. you know, and, and it waters down the art. The beauty of this story is that the agenda is basically the story, yep. you know, and because it's it's just woven all through it. So it doesn't feel like it comes out yep. of left field because it was the Jesus movement of a historical time. We just leaned into it. Yeah. And this was really had a lot to do with, you know, my brother is the writer and, and director with Brent McCorkle is the idea that they leaned into uh, was this was a time where the overtness of it was the rebelliousness of right. it. Right. And it's like those two things shouldn't go together. You know, the, the idea of something that's overtly Christian and counterculture, how does that go together? The idea of the big conflicts within the church, but it being the most uniquely pure version of Christianity that I think our, 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 our nation has seen in the past 200 years. So it's like, uh, you know, how did all those things, it's the contradiction that makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. And people kind of lean in and like, I shouldn't be liking this, <laughs> but I like it. Yeah. And, and I've actually enjoyed the most showing it to people that are from the secular side of things and it trips them out. Yeah. It just trips them out. And like in other things that we've done that, like, you know, with, I can only imagine, you know, a movie that you starred in, you know, I can thank only you, imagine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> Typecast, yes, but you're in it. But so, starring. And, and, and like, my, thank favorite, you my from... favorite moment in my career is when we won a Dove Award for that. And I agreed on the red carpet <laughs> that if we won, that you could come up on stage and accept it. Yeah. And as soon as they announced this, I see you like a hundred yard dash oh, sprinter. Yeah. Like full, like just, you know, I'm a running good 40 down rows oh, back. You were like leaping <laughs> over sections. You beat me to the stage. And I'm like, and it so took my breath away that I was like, I don't know what to say. I'm like, it took me literally. But anyway, you know, I imagine when we got yeah. to the part where we earned that breakfast table scene with uh, Bart and his dad, you know, there was a large portion of the uh, initial test audience that was worried that, you know, well, he should forgive his dad right away. Right. And I was like, well, that's not real life. I mean, he was abused as a kid. And right. then this is the first time that he has any real power. The first thing he's going to feel is angry. Right. And uh, and he's not. So when he gets to that moment where he's like, God can forgive you, I can't. Yeah. You know, and then he has to kind of work his way towards that. That's real life. And I think in real life, there's an opportunity for the message to shine in a way that's not expected. Well, I, I've always told people when they're writing Christian movies or they're asking my opinion about stuff, I'm like, it, 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 like, write it, write it like you want to write it. And then the part where you have the big pivotal moment about faith, uh, go back through and take about the last paragraph off. Because <laughs> yep. like you've got the you've got this great moment and the soliloquy is good. And then you have to heavy hand and then it. your monologue. Yeah, exactly. Just take Take that last paragraph out. You'll probably be okay. Yeah, exactly. But, but even but it happens in, in mainstream movie, yeah. movies too. Okay. Uh, a, a Man Called Otto yeah. with Tom Hanks. Yeah. Great film. Yeah. Loved it. Have you seen it yet? Yeah, I saw it. Okay. So great. But then the second they introduced the trans character, instantly you're like, agenda. Here yeah. it is. Like, And, and so it, everybody does it. You mentioned Hallmark movies. Yeah. Like you lose the art yeah, in it, the agenda. It, if you get, you know, it just has to be rooted in story. It can't be because you're trying to check a box. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's other ones that have done it uh, for their perspective. Every movie preaches. 
uh, other ones just do it better than others. Yeah. So like, you know, uh, there's movies that, you know, don't really affect the way I, you know, I think or my beliefs, but they, they do it in a way that really earns it. And so when it gets to that moment, it kind of hits you in a way that makes you consider somebody else's opinion. You know, as Christians, we can either rail against that or we can do it on our own. And by earning the right to be heard, planning the thought, but letting people begin to kind of wrestle with that for themselves and not feel like we got to seal the deal. So we just we tell stories of redemption. We plant that seed and plant that idea. And we just take a step back and say, you know, let it be what it is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, it's called it's called emotional jamming. If I can jam a wedge between somebody's heart and their head, and make them feel something, then it will stick and it will begin to reverse engineer it to their head and challenge their thinking. Now, is That's emotional jamming something you learned in film school, or is that something like psycholog psychological you learned? There's, there's other. It's fascinating. It, wait, it's not original to us. There's other communities that have used it well. Okay. And we've studied kind of their strategies, and we're like, well, as Christians, we can either criticize that, or we can say, can we use that? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a very useful tool that other communities have done much more brilliantly than we have. Yeah. And so we're like, we're going to adopt that. So originality is just forgetting the source. So Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a guy tell me, originality, is the, the secret of that is learning to conceal your sources. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Lonnie Frisbee in this is like the itinerant preacher right. played by the guy who plays uh, Jesus in The Chosen. And, uh, you know... <sighs> This part of this movie super landed with me and yep. super scared me. Yep. Uh, and I'm curious for you yep. as somebody that creates things. Um, so he gets it all out of whack and he yep. starts thinking that he's doing the healing mm -hmm. and he's hearing from God and it becomes all about him and he's lost what it was that made yep. him great, you know. And so that part landed with me yep. and I'm like, oh, my gosh, like I I fear losing what I have because I start trying to control it myself or I take it yep. for granted. Do you ever like wake up at night and like have a fear like that? All the time. I, okay. have, I have nightmares about it and I wake up and they're like, what did I do? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm, you know, it's like, you know, the idea, you know, I, I think because God chooses to use um, messy people mm -hmm. and all of us have our insecurities. So oh, like, yeah. Like I remember when I, when I was mixing Underdog, I was on the stage at, at, at Sony, and the other three stages that were or, or screens that were mixing next to me, one was uh, Denzel Washington was mixing his movie mm. that he had directed. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. <laughs> Across the hallway was Michael Mann, who was who was mixing. You know, the guy that did Heat and all these you know huge action movies in the nineties. He's mixing his TV series, and then the the fourth stage was Jason Reitman was test screening Ghostbusters. Oh. And I was like, so I texted a buddy. I was like, who's the imposter here? <laughs> That's and then, interesting. And then he texted back and he's like, honestly, all four of you. I'm like, all right. Oh, that's <laughs> really touché, good. Touché. That yeah. is that yeah. is a great yeah. commentary, yeah. man. Like, you know, we're all we're all just faking it and yeah. thinking like if anybody knew that I didn't know what I was doing, they'd expose yeah. me. But I think the idea with Alani's character is he's a really complex guy. Um, but he was the secret sauce. Uh, him and Chuck Smith together were the secret sauce to the Jesus movement. Right. And, um, you know, Lonnie had this wildness about him that was very intriguing. But then all of a sudden, in the midst of this huge awakening that he was th the spark for, he started kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and thinking yeah. like, hey, this is because I'm a big deal. Yeah. And then that just completely subverted all the things that he had been a part of. And that is a terrifying reality. And I think we're all capable of that. I know I am. Mm -hmm. You know, that idea of starting to believe the hype that this is about me. Yep. Instead of, God, I got to be a moment of what something you're doing. That's why I suggest for you yeah. that you find yourself a Betty. Uh, <laughs> like, you need a Betty. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. Betty will make sure that you know what it is and about you. And she will keep you humble. The amount that is unsaid between you two, when <laughs> yes. you say a comment, she gets this little smirk. And her right eyebrow just goes up and is like... <laughs> <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Everybody, I think, uh, needs a Betty in their life for sure. All right, so uh, down to this. How do you know a film is going to be a hit before the first dollar comes in? And how do you know one's going to be a bomb? Well, if, it, if I knew how to do that, we'd only make hits, Wally. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, 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 okay, now you take yourself out. Okay. Mom's Night Out was a great movie. Okay. okay. I love it. Okay. You said you're never doing another comedy, comedy again. Well, it's just because I had to turn in like five years of my life yeah. you know, span for doing that one. It made me laugh. Yeah, it was, it was, that was that was a lot of fun. We had a good time. We had a good time, but it's stressful. Doing comedy is hard. Yeah. Uh, what you guys do, making things funny uh, and still relatable, that's a challenge. But, the, you know, for, for us, you know, I think the thing is we test screen it like a lot and just to see is there a hunger for it. 
And, you know, with Jesus Revolution, it's one that we took out and we've done a really outside the box marketing thing that we hadn't done since Imagine. Lionsgate has allowed us to take it to these churches and doing big screenings with like the whole church mm. to kind of test it. So we've probably done at this point like probably 35 of those like big ones. Like I'm on Tuesday, I'm at the rock in San Diego and then like we were at Bethel and we were at the the faith, faith church in St. Louis. And you know, we've been all over and seeing it play with a crowd. Like there is this surge of energy that comes out of that. And we're like, okay, this, this is, this is definitely on target. Mm -hmm. And then it just comes to the point of people vote with their tickets. And right. it's just like, if people show up at the theater, that's what, you know, and you can't ever tell if that's actually going to happen. You just have a good feeling, and this one has a good feeling, so we'll see. I think it would be really frustrating when you write something, and you're like, oh, this is the bring it home point, or this is funny, it's going to get a yeah. laugh, and oh, you're watching people watch it, and it's <laughs> freaking it's like, oh! <laughs> you're like, you want to stand up and go, that's funny! What is wrong with all of you? <laughs> I want to hire you just to be at the theater yeah. to like heckle the crowd. <laughs> just go, ha! Yeah, exactly. The, the, uh, it's, the car it, scene was funny. Well, it was fun. That yeah. was a great scene. So, the, you know, we call it the, the, the burn the village moment, you know, where you have the, the moment in a like a like you know a movie like Beauty and the Beast, and all of a sudden all the villagers rise up and they're like, "We're gonna burn! We're gonna go kill the beast!" And yeah. like they all decide to like, so it's a terrifying moment to be in a crowd when they decide all at once to like burn down your village and like we're gonna go destroy this film. We hate it, mm. and they collectively decide it, and it's a it's a terrifying experience. You know, one of the things the first times it happened. So when John and I we got started at this youth camp up in New York, and we would do like these film shorts for the kids, like Star Wars and different things like that. And we just do it to entertain the kids. That's where we first fell in love with telling stories. There's nothing more honest than a f group of 500 high schoolers mm. watching the crawl. <laughs> yeah, you know, is this good or is this bad? And there was this moment where we did that. One of the first ones we did was like this Knights of the Round Table kind of King Arthur kind of deal. And it gets to the end and then it ends with a live thing on stage with like pyrotechnics and like things that we thought was like, like Lord of the Rings ep 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 epic. And we got to the end of it. And it's like, it's crickets. Nobody's applauding. And all of a sudden, there's this one, like, 14-year-old kid on the front row. And he's like, is that it? <laughs> so, so to this day. Nice try, to, bro. It's like, oh, is that it? So to this day, <laughs> to this day, my brother cannot be in the audience when somebody's watching his movies. Really? Because he's convinced this guy's going to come back as a 40-year-old man. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, so sometimes just to trip him out, if John's in the audience, I get to the end and everybody's applauding. I'll be like, is that it? <laughs> Like, that, who's in there? <laughs> I know that you named your uh, company Kingdom Story, but I think Is That It would have been a is great production <laughs> company name. <laughs> Just mess with him. Be like, John, we're going to change the name. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing, too. Um, like, you're you're still in the midst of Jesus Revolution, but your guys are always working farther out. Mm -hmm. yep. What's the next story? Like, now I would oh. like, you were like telling me about this one beforehand. I'm yeah. like, I don't know. Yeah. And then it's really good. So, what's the next story you're well, we've working got, on? We've got, we've got three or four that are in the can. Um, uh, one one that's coming out in the fall is this movie called uh, Ordinary Angels that uh, Hilary Swank stars in, uh, along with Alan Richardson from the Reacher series, and John Gunn directed it. And this film is fantastic. So um, it was brought to us actually by Dave Matthews. No way. Yeah. So who's not a Christian, but he saw this story that was a true story, fell in love with it, brought it to Lionsgate, and Lionsgate came to us and like, hey, you're our faith guys. This has faith in it. You know, what do you think? We knew the story. We knew it was about Southeast Church in Louisville and this amazing story of this community rallying around this girl in a blizzard to get her uh, to uh, airlift it out for a kidney or a, a, a liver transplant. And it's just an amazing true story. So that one's coming out. Okay. Is it already shot? It's already shot. It's already <sighs> shot. It's, yep. We need a DJ. <laughs> uh, the, the weather's I, were pretty I could, bad I could, today. I could, I, could, I could work you in as a bartender. <laughs> oh, my God. As, Done. As some sort of like, you know, like low level mobster. Okay. I like that. Uh, I like that. Uh, maybe somebody that's working their way out of homelessness. They're not homeless anymore. <laughs> not a problem. You know? I, I kind of got that look. You know, you know. And, and this, you know, the, the creepy guy on the dance floor. One of those things I think we can make work. I could do them all. <laughs> <laughs> All at once. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No. So then the next one, the next one I'm doing is uh, my favorite book is this book called Fearless. It's about a Navy SEAL named Adam Brown. I love this book. And so it's, it's going to be a, a bigger budget film that Jason Hall that wrote American Snipers writing the script for. Oh, nice. So that, this one's going to be, it's exciting. So I've, I've been working it for five years to get this book. Holy cow. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, that's cool. 
cool, man. Yeah. Well, there you go. More good stuff to look forward to. You notice, yes, Lady Rock. <laughs> you notice in that last one that he mentioned, he yeah. didn't say you could play no, anything. <laughs> nothing. Didn't bring it up. Didn't even bring it up. I satisfied it on yeah. the one that was already yeah. shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have been great for yeah. this role. It's yeah. already done. Didn't bring up you could be a mechanic, yeah, maybe yeah. a guy that holds something. Yeah, well, an American hero. You look yeah, like you could play yeah. the part of an American hero. No? <laughs> Not even be, close. It would be like a tourist that gets somehow accidentally killed on the streets. It would be a good death. <laughs> I'll take it. I'm pretty yeah. good at that. I yeah. could die like there the best go. of them. Okay. I, I die every day on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and working with Betty, I die a little. Oh, okay. <laughs> the sniper over here. The yeah, assa- that's the true. She is. The assassin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I ask some questions? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Please. You're going to let her talk. Oh, like, yeah. Like, what, he went on like, what, like 30 minutes oh, there without like, taking a He's got to get his, yeah. well, you know. Wasn't all... alone here. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, he, you <laughs> chimed in a few times, too. This comes back to him. Okay, so I think I'm speaking for everyone when I ask these questions. We always get the side of Wally on how it's like being on one of the sets of your movies. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And how he is just amazing. He's great at what he does. Mm-hmm. That he was the one that brought in all the people to see the film. <laughs> all these things. And I promise you, I promise you, if not daily, it is at least weekly that he brings up the fact that he has been in two of your movies. Uh, it, it, it has slowed two down a little, two but for a while Well, because <laughs> people are actually rolling their eyes. You can hear them rolling their eyes. So let me ask this. What is it really like working with Wally on set? Um, uh, Wally, uh, well, he's a bit of a diva. You of know, course. I, have to, I have to talk him out of his trailer at least once a day. He's like, you know, railing about that his writer wasn't met with the uh-huh. and all Absolutely. That stuff. the no the uh, Wally is very eager like and mm. and the funny thing was is like it's I love taking somebody that's very confident in their environment and putting them in something new and mm-hmm. watching them kind of like so like it happens all the time my producing partner Kevin Downs is an actor as well and so Kevin uh you know when he's a producer he comes in and he's like jaded and like really but as soon as he's an actor he comes in that day and he's like all a bundle of nerves he's like mm-hmm. how do i look you know what's my mm-hmm. motivation i mm-hmm. don't know like who are you yeah. so while yeah. he comes in yeah. and he's like we're about to shoot the I Can Only Imagine scene, and he's like, I, you know, I, I really, I really, I, I, you know, I was thinking, I, I, I was thinking that maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I could. Sounds like Porky it, Pig. It's like, it's like, yeah. no, I was like, I was like, dude, you're a DJ every day. Yeah. He's like, I, I don't know, I don't. I, I, I was thinking it was maybe nerve wracking. Like, <laughs> yeah, and the other part like, of that, I'm like, action, put the CD in the yeah. like, <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> I told you, I told you. Okay. We had so many people that were like, wait, I missed it. Where was yeah. it? Yeah. I was like, if you blink it, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna miss yeah, him great. in the movie. It's Here's, okay, here's what happened. You, you're very right about that. Like when you're in your own world, you're yeah. the king of that domain. Exactly. But when, like, I'm a type eight on the Enneagram. Yeah. Uh-huh. I don't have to be the leader if somebody else is better than yeah, me at right, something. Right. So, like in that world, the I, thing is, no one is ever better than you. No, in here, no. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, but in that world, absolutely. Like I'm like the 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 like the kid that knows nothing, and so I'm like trying to figure this out. But what Andy doesn't tell you is, I'm already nervous. Okay, and then they spend a good forty minutes getting the room right yep. and getting it all set up and lighting and taping measuring and all this stuff and then they're like and there's one guy in the corner that's like we're losing the room in 15 minutes we're losing the room in 10 minutes we're losing the room in three and a half minutes all right wally we're ready for you i'm like i don't even know what i'm doing i've got three and a half minutes he's like wally we have no time yeah. this one but try not to stink yeah yeah don't look at your hands just put it in there so i'm like oh my gosh it's like will Feral, yeah. What do I do with my hands? He's got the CD case. Yeah. Yeah. It's shaking. He's like shaking. Oh. Like, I can't get into the system. It's horrible, no, man. Okay, well, it's then, horrible. And then when we got to American Underdog, like there was an eagerness because he's like, now he's got a taste of being a star. Right. Yes. Oh, so yes. with American Underdog, I called him literally the day that we were needing to do the recording of like the, the radio <laughs> announcer. On a Sunday. Because somebody I, I, I dropped out. Up, I called him, call him up and I'm like, <laughs> I like, uh, hey, hey, Wally, I'm doing, I'm doing the this uh, Kurt Warner film. I was wondering if I, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> the phone goes click, and then there's a ring at the front door. Yes. <laughs> He's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, what do you mean? I'm it. here for you. He's literally I knew there in five it. minutes. Oh, okay. absolutely. So we were told that in the first one, the oh, I can only imagine, that you needed a taller person mm-hmm. and that he actually had to stand on a box. Is that true? Uh, yes. The, yes. <laughs> Wally is not actually six foot four. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. So he no. was... He, when we, <laughs> Well, we went, we went, um, he's never going to have to be on the show again, but I no, like you. absolutely so, not. So I feel, I feel safe on this side of the table. I'm loving everything so, you're so, saying. So, so when, we, when, we, when we went to go do the first shot, 
we said action, and he walks across to go put the CD of the player and say his you know lines with his microphone, and all you saw was the top part of his forehead <laughs> walking across the equipment. I was like, we all looked. We're like, do we have an Apple box? <laughs> we did money oh my too. gosh! Yeah, yeah. So, so I had to stand on a we box. We built a platform for him. Yeah, that so. is awesome. But I'd like to point out that Tom Cruise also needs an yes, Apple box. Tom, so. most, most of your most famous actors are five six or under. Yes, exactly. Tom so. Cruise is taller than no, you. he's not. He's yes, five. He he's not five six. <laughs> Thank no, you. I will Google it right. It now. doesn't matter. Wrong. That's his press agent. That's his press agent. No. He's a little guy. Yeah, this is a guy that makes movies. He just called him a little guy. He's calling you a little guy. Doesn't matter. It's in the same category as Tom Cruise. Yeah. It's a compliment. Exactly. Sounds like you're saying some good actors actually are in your movie. Yeah. <laughs> so let me let me ask this other question. Okay, so in the next uh, film that he was in, Underdog, yes. he didn't have actually a part where you actually see him on yes. the right. It's his voice. Was there a reason for that based off of what he had done in I Can Only Imagine? Oh, man. Like, did you strategically plan that? Because you were like, he was a well, hot mess. I, I, well, well <laughs> I, I, uh, um, uh-huh. we'll talk about this off air. Uh-huh. <laughs> I reached I my comfort level. I knew it. I knew it. comfort level. <laughs> well, I felt like it would, it, there's, this, there's this line that we use in the movie that was, we call it uh, jumping the shark. Yes. And it comes off a, a, an episode of Happy Days. Where in later episodes it got a little bit outlandish, and the, the Fonz was skiing on this one thing, and then there's a like a fake looking shark that comes out, yeah. and he jumps over the shark while he's skiing, and so it was so threw the audience out that they hated the series from that point on. Mm-hmm. So we're like, don't jump the shark, right? So you know the idea of having the same looking because Wally's got one look, it that's goes, it. it works mm-hmm. for him, yeah, but that's it, it works for him. It's like this is it. It's the okay. scrape, you know, the the beard that goes in all directions. <laughs> that's all I got, and the, 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 <laughs> and, and, and the '90s jewelry and like rings all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. like, the, I thought, you know, going from Imagine to Underdog, having that same guy would be like, wait a minute, is this, like, what in the world is this the only radio they got? I see. Yeah, yeah. We got I his see. iconic golden pipes in there. Yeah, so, so there I you see. go. Uh, okay, one final question. Oh, you, please, this is so much fun. <laughs> so Wally, I don't know if you know this, but Wally is 54 years old. Wow. Yeah, okay. oh man. So you're probably what, 45? 45. 45? 45. Wow, I'm, sorry. I'm really good at that. Yeah. Okay, so at your age yes. and you looking at him at 54, do you think that it's appropriate for a man his age <laughs> to have as much jewelry as he has on? Do you I, think it's okay? I will say, like, your forearm muscles must be massive. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of rings you have on your right hand. But you got it's some like, jewelry going, I, too. I got, I got a little bit. You I got have a little three bit, bracelets. But, man, yeah, I, got three, I, got, I got a few. But and I mean, a like, watch. Oh, I don't even have mine like, on. I feel like you must do, like, wrist exercises. <laughs> yeah. Over okay. there, so you know, do you have any necklaces? I got, I got, I got, I got a couple. I got a couple. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we're not all okay. that far okay. off. Maybe it's just well, an age thing. Yeah, I, I feel like I mean, you get to that age where you embrace being kind of the frumpy dad, right? Like you try to have at least some edge to you, right? And the best edge you can have is just to have like a I don't care kind of thing. Mm. That's pretty much me. Yeah, and oh, that's kind of care. yes. It's yeah. like, but you do care, but you don't want it to look like you care. Right? Oh, okay, so you're so. a little insecure. Oh, uh, yes. massively. <laughs> yeah, massively. Everybody, <laughs> every every great talent is. Insecure. Yeah, it's like see it, what I did there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's having a great time. When you have brilliance like myself, right? You're going to you be know, insecure. There's some residual. One question. Yes. One more. Oh wow. I'm, Sorry, I'm, they I'm just keep coming. This. this is great. Funny, okay. she has like, none of these like written her. down either. They're all just pent up inside yeah, of her. Just, well, I just, she was so like 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 cat reflexes still the whole time. Ready. I was just ready. Was just like, is it my turn? Okay, it's my turn now. Okay. <laughs> How much do you hate Wally? <laughs> okay, so you've seen how he is on set, yes. and you can compare him to other actors you've worked with, yes. like Kelsey Grammer. Yeah, right, right, right. Amazing. So what are some tips you have for people who are maybe looking into getting into the film industry? They want oh. to be an actor, maybe on a subpar level like Wally. <laughs> or entry level. We thought entry level is a better term for that. <laughs> or a professional level, like Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. So what would your tips be to someone? Oh, don't. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like I, tell, I tell my kids all the time, I was like, if you want to be involved in film, I will help you with whatever you want to do to get a leg up. Yeah. My one rule is you cannot act. No yeah. acting. Mm. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it's like for people that want to do it, you know, the, the biggest thing is just lear- learning how to, everybody's like, um, you know, there's this w- one actor that I work with that they had so rehearsed the scene in the mirror the night before. 
Mm-hmm. They had one way they were going to do You're it. You're talking yeah. about Wallace. Yeah. So, yeah. You're talking about cheating. Yeah. 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 As soon as I came over, I was like, <laughs> why don't we try it like this? And yeah. then, then all of a sudden, they just went, sh- they shut down. They're just like, but that's the way I prepared it. Right. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm totally numb now. I don't feel anything. I'm dead inside. Yeah. And they start panicking. So the biggest thing is just learning how to be natural. And it's one thing, uh, Wally alluded to it, it's one thing to be natural in your environment. It's another thing being natural with a bunch of bright lights and about 100 grown men that are kind of ugly looking grips standing there just staring at you <laughs> while you do your thing. And, and it's like, like and then yeah. they do it like 50 times in yeah, a row. That's right. right. And so. for the record, it's not just put the CD player in. You have to have <laughs> your arm at a weird angle yeah. because it's in the shot and it has to come in behind your head and, and you then you've got to slide it in. Right. Yeah. It's not yeah. just yeah. put the CD yeah. player in because there's more to movie magic than that, okay? Harder <laughs> than it looks. There's <laughs> some truth to that. Yeah. It's also Thank like, you. well, you're putting a CD in a CD player. Just... <laughs> okay, seriously? <laughs> I knew it. Oh, this lived up to my expectations. Well, it was that, wonderful. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the movie is uh, something by the Kendrick Brothers and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you talk about that <laughs> with Mom's Night Out. I was at this. I was at this signing once for Mom's Night Out, and everybody came up and they would give me these emotional stories about your films. They changed my life. Like, thank you. Like, man, it was just so powerful, so emotional. Thank you. Your film saved my marriage. And then I'd have to stop and be like, I didn't direct Fireproof. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, rather than you telling them the truth, it's like you ruin their moment because they're like, I thought I was talking to that person. Yeah. And they like they you rob- so I got tired of robbing people of that. So I sat for the rest of that session and I there's a, about a thousand posters of, of Mom's Night Out where I signed it thank you for coming Alex Kendrick <laughs> 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 That's awesome. <laughs> well, there you go. The movie is The Jesus Revolution. The man, the myth, the legend is Andy Irwin. And we appreciate you taking the time to be on the show with us today. Thank you, guys. I'm glad it helped negotiate your dysfunction. Oh, no. We need to go to therapy <laughs> after this. I'm hurt. <laughs>